My name is Douglas Noreen. I'm the president of the Friends of the City Rally Museum. We're the fundraising arm uh, of the museum. Thank you all for coming tonight. I want to especially thank our guest panelists this evening. I'm really looking forward to a special night. We're going to start with a very uh, brief video. Uh, it's only uh, about five minutes describing uh, the exhibit that we're here to fundraise for tonight. And then our museum director, Ernie, is going to kick us off and introduce our panelists. Um, thank you again for coming and for your support of the museum. Welcome to the City of Raleigh Museum. Established in 1993 as a small private history museum, we now operate as part of the City of Raleigh's Historic Resources and Museums Division, welcoming over 40,000 visitors a year. With exhibits supported by resources raised by your hosts this evening, the Friends of the City of Raleigh Museum. The mission of the museum is not only to preserve and interpret the history of our city's past, but to bring to light the richness of our neighborhoods and culture in the present day and be a forum for discussion of issues that will mold the city in the future. The museum's tagline, then, now, next, reflects this vision. From its origins, Raleigh has always been a planned community. The initial big decision to locate the new state capitol in this location in the central Piedmont was followed by the adoption of the William Christmas Plan of 1792 that established the five square framework centered on the state capitol building and the rectilinear grid of streets that now constitute our downtown. Over our 224 year history, circumstances have provided ample opportunity for our leaders and citizens to make many more big decisions that shape the great city we experience today. In recent memory, such important milestones as the establishment of the Research Triangle Park, the construction of Falls Lake, the merger of city and county schools, the election of our first African American and our first woman mayor, the construction of major new groundbreaking developments such as Cameron Village, North Hills, Briar Creek, and Wakefield, and the rediscovery of the richness and excitement of urban life by investments made in our downtown in the 21st century have altered the path that the city has taken and reshaped what is now arguably one of the most livable, economically healthy, and well-managed cities in the country. Tonight, we have the opportunity to revisit many of these big decisions with leaders who played no small role in them and to consider the big decisions we are faced with today that may shape the future of this place, as well as anticipate the decisions we will have to make tomorrow to keep what is best about Raleigh sustainable into the future. This forum is taking place tonight as part of the museum's development of a major new permanent exhibit. Raleigh City Lab is to be the museum's first million dollar exhibit scheduled to open in late 2019. The idea behind Raleigh City Lab is to tell the story of the historical development of the city show the wonderful complexity of the systems and culture that support the community we know today, and be a laboratory for our children and citizens of the city today to explore the issues and challenges we face going into the future, the Research and Development Center for City Building in Raleigh. This effort began with a series of public meetings held in December and January with our consultants, Hazlip Associates of Nashville, Tennessee, and Asheville, North Carolina, who are helping the museum develop a master plan Throughout the next year, more events like this one tonight will provide opportunities for you to help shape Raleigh City Lab as it is designed and constructed. The City Council has set aside $500,000 in the five-year capital budget to be matched by the Friends of the Core Museum in order to make Raleigh City Lab a reality. To this point, the Friends have raised $100,000 of our $500,000 goal, and we will need help from all of you to meet this challenge. It's a big, audacious goal that reflects the community's high aspirations, a community that is building one of the nation's most extraordinary new parks, growing the nation's premier university research campus, and setting our sights on a future city where everyone has access to convenient, sustainable transportation and affordable housing. We hope you will join us in making Raleigh City Lab a reality. Thank you for attending tonight. director of the museum, so this is my job day in, day out. So we're very excited to see you here this evening. And 
can sort of recap this video, the entire genesis for this evening stems from this incredible opportunity the museum has. And it's this exhibit called City Lab. And when I first came on five years ago, they said, we're going to do this exhibit called City Lab, where we look at how the city was born, how it grew, how it developed, and really those decisions which really made us a great city. So it's an incredible exhibit uh, to that would make us a regional destination as a museum, but also chart a path for the future. We always look back at the past, but this exhibit, and tonight we really want to consider how do we move from the past to the future. So we've established and brought in a wonderful collection of those individuals who have really shaped this city and its future. And so we really wanted to bring together those who have made such an impact and just sort of pick their brains on why they did what they did, how it turned out, and how will this shape the future. So I know many of these people need no introduction, but I'm the MC, so I'm going to give you an introduction. So first off, John Kane founded Kane Realty in 1978 and perhaps is the best known developer of the new North Hills. Uh, in addition, his leadership and other noteworthy mixed use developments, such as Dillon Complex under construction, in the Warehouse District near Union Station, and a new 12-story development at the corner of Peace and West Streets in Glenwood South District. Mr. John Kane, everybody. Uh, next, Mr. Smeeds York, who is an author on top of everything. Uh, served as mayor from Raleigh from 1979 to 1993 after being elected to the Raleigh City Council in 1977. In addition to playing on the North Carolina State University basketball team, Smeeds and York properties have been active players in real estate development and market in Raleigh for many decades. And Smeeds' father, Willie York, was the developer of Cameron Village. Smeeds York. <laughs> Next, we have Mayor Nancy McFarland, who was elected mayor of the city of Raleigh in 2011, a role she continues to hold today. Prior to this, she served on the Raleigh City Council from 2007 and 2011. And during her administration, the city has grown substantially and has acquired and begun the process to plan Dorothea Dix Park, a 308-acre park on the site of the former mental hospital and serves on the Dix Park Executive Committee. Mayor McFarland. <laughs> uh, next up, we have Charles Meeker, who also served as mayor from 2001 to 2011. Prior to this, Charles served as a city council member from 1985 to 1989, and from 1991 to 1995. Charles led a joint effort by the Raleigh City Council and Wake County Commissioners to revitalize downtown Raleigh, and served as mayor during the reconstruction of Fayetteville Street, the Convention Center, Red Hat Amphitheater, and City Plaza. Mayor Meeker. Uh, next, we have Dr. Bill McNeil, who joined the Wake County School System in 1974 as a teacher. And after serving in a variety of administrative roles, rose to become superintendent of this and one of the largest public school systems in the nation. From the years of 2000 to 2006, Bill was named the National School Superintendent of the Year in 2004 by the American Association of School Administrators. Dr. McNeil. So this evening, we've got prepared some of these questions that we thought many of you would like to hear to talk about how this city developed. So it's going to be a combination of direct questions at some of you, and then it's going to free for all speed round. <laughs> so the first question I'm going to pitch to you, our esteemed body, is what do you think are some of the most uh, successful city planning stories in Raleigh's past? Seventy ninety two. I wasn't here, but we started out in a planned city. Okay, so <laughs> tradition of, of planning, but the city really started to grow after the Second World War in the fifties. But really in the sixties, when IBM came into the park in nineteen sixty five, cities in North Carolina can grow through annexation and into the what's called extraterritorial jurisdiction. There are actually, twelve cities in Wake County, but when Raleigh really started to grow in the 60s and 70s, there was a lot of the same issues there are today, how to manage growth, how to 
plan for growth. You had the neighborhood leaders, university folks, business folks, and during the, uh, and I didn't last at the mayor quite as long as I uh, said, I was 79 to 83. <laughs> Couldn't make it for the last 10 years. <laughs> we, uh, we, in the early 70s, not too much history, and I'll stop here in a second, but there was an effort called the Yellow Pages. It was a big division in the city, folks really trying to stop growth, and there was a group that wanted to move growth forward, certainly in a planned sort of way. So there was put together a comprehensive planning committee, and we adopted the first comprehensive plan in 1979, and it had four members of the city council, four members of the planning commission, four members of the CACs, and four members of a group called FRAD, which is Progress for Rod of the Orderly Development. And we got a unanimous vote from that committee, from the planning <coughs> commission, and from the council. So I think the planning never ends, but I think that was the beginning, and the comprehensive plan has had many updates. But that's a general answer to that question. Let me, uh, let me just add a couple of things. Uh, back in 1987, North Carolina State University, one of the great research universities in the world, came to the council with a master plan for the Centennial Campus. The council signed off on that after some road changes in about six or eight weeks, three or four meetings, and it's allowed NC State to sort of go to the next, next level here in Raleigh. That didn't come back to the council every time for approve each building. A huge thing for NC State, and of course, a huge thing for Raleigh. The other one I think of is the North Hills Master Plan. John came in, I'm thinking it's 2005, 2006, something like that, uh, and had, he got the master plan approved for him on the first phase on the, on the west side there. So he's been able to build, in effect, a second downtown here in Raleigh without coming back every time we each building approved. So that, those are two big planning efforts that really turned out well for the city. Now, tell a funny story on, on Mayor Pinker, my good friend over there. <laughs> so, we had had a contentious rezoning or site plan approval on the redoing the mall the first time around. It was actually highly uh, contentious. We got it approved. And the next time around, we, the one that Charles was speaking of, the rezoning on the east side of the street was a major master plan redevelopment proposal. And we had no opposition. Everybody was in favor of it. It was just it was very, very quiet. And, came before the council. I hadn't really even engaged Charles before the vote. We came up for the vote and I was up presenting it and, and Charles said, well, John, how many stories could you have on this side of the street? And I said, well, Mr. Mayor, I guess really up to about 35 stories. <laughs> and Charles went, what? <laughs> I mean, it had been such a quiet case and it had not been a bit, Charles didn't vote for it. Thank you. <laughs> That's how things get slipped by. <laughs> I, I'd say, um, certainly, with Charles's credit, one of the biggest decisions was reopening Fayetteville Street after the decision, hopefully no one here was a part of, to close it. Um, but that and also his encouragement of, was it CPL? It was, it was a, a company that he really convinced to come down to this desolate wasteland. It wasn't really. And then, of course, from that, moving forward with, you know, the convention center and tearing down the old city center and all of those. And, you know, just those steps forward are, are why we have the, you know, exciting downtown we have now. I'm going to add the second major decision made by the school district. The first would have been merger, and I'm going to talk about that later. But the second that no one talks about that I think uh, not only is historic, but put this community education, and I'm talking secondary education at this point, on its path, and, and that would be back in uh, the early 80s, 28 magnet schools started in 1982, that opened, and if you don't know anything about magnet schools, these are schools that are designed to draw people in voluntarily, which means that they have special programs, whether it's classical, uh, it could be one uh, performing arts, any number of programs, uh, academically gifted programs, that you bring people into schools, which is a voluntary way of desegregating your school system. And if you look at Wake County today, we are still the community with the largest number of magnet schools in the nation and historically we have won more awards nationally for magnet schools than any other now 
Here is the reason why you have magnets. Because of the competition that magnets bring within a school district, as superintendent, I knew that for every magnet school that was established, there was some traditional school that was working on a plan to keep children in their school and not have them go to magnet school, which means that if they up the ante in order to be able to keep kids home, then we had to up the ante with <coughs> magnet schools. If you chart the academic progress of this community, you will see it was that competitive spirit that led to the growth and the national model that we now have. Obviously, like that prom picture they put in there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you all so very much for that one. Uh, there's going to be several opportunities to do shameless plugs for museum programs throughout the evening. This is the first one. Uh, so, this is for you, uh, Mary York. Uh, Cameron Village was one of the first suburban shopping centers built in the country. What was unique about it, and why did it change the shape of the city? And uh, the shameless plug is that the museum is going to be doing uh, opening an exhibit on the Cameron Village Underground coming up in July. So if you want to get a sneak peek into Raleigh's music history, which came out of Cameron Village, come by the museum. Thank you. We're going to try to open up another uh, underground uh, tavern here. We've got plans for that, but that's coming up. But that was an exciting part. But what was unique about it, my, my dad, he bought this land and he was planning to build homes. He built a lot of houses, and he heard about the idea of a shopping center and was able to, his membership in the Urban Land Institute, to learn from J.C. Nichols with Country Club Plaza in Kansas City about what a shopping center was, and there were no malls at that, at that time. So the shopping center opened in 1949, and it was not just the shopping center, it was 550 apartments, and. 100 plus single family detached homes, one of the we lives in, and the and office buildings. But the thing that was really different was the common ownership of the property, common management, uh, common marketing, and free parking. Those were the things that distinguished Camden Village from, say, the downtown. And the downtown at that time was still doing fairly well, but lots of people were moving out into the suburbs. Hard to think of Cameron Village as a suburb, but that was pretty much what it was uh, thought of. So a lot of you know, planning uh, went into that, but the key thing and is that you have to be doing something new, different all the time. You can't just sit there. If we still had what we had in 1950, we wouldn't be here probably. But recently, we've had a new Starbucks. I hope you all have to that. Uh, Two-story Chick-fil-A, the only one in the United <laughs> And we hope to do something back with the subway. But John will certainly attest, you need to bring something new all the time. You've got to keep the excitement up. So the big thing, though, was common ownership, common management, common marketing, and having it all right there under the same direction. So how do you think that relationship to downtown, did it siphon off those businesses from downtown? I would say it was a reaction to what was happening, and that was people during think about history, you had the 30s with the Depression, and then you had the 40s with the war years, and there was almost nothing built, no homes built much in, in those almost 20 years. So after the war, everything broke loose, and people were moving out, and so I think it was more a reaction to a trend that was happening than to, to bringing people out. I mean, competition is the lifeblood of business. So John here, we, we have a occasional competition over a tenant, but uh, you know, North Hills has been there since 67. It was a mall, and Cameronville's been there since 49. So, you know, the competition is, has continued. But a lot of people feel like that, and, and maybe that would be one case that it brought businesses from downtown. Certainly, we had at least 15 businesses that were downtown that did open in Cameronville. I talked to one old timer, and they said, Raleigh didn't become cosmopolitan until after this World War II. Yeah. <laughs> so I'll say one other thing. My dad, I mean, it was a big risk, and he 
did not name it York Village because he thought it might not make it. So he did not name it. <laughs> next question must be written by somebody who's in the Parks and Rec Department because it reads, uh, are open space, greenways, and park systems considered one of the best in the country? What were some of the big decisions that made here in Raleigh that will benefit us today? How did those green spaces and those parks, how did the political capital come about to make all of that happen? I think part of the answer to that is that citizens have routinely approved parks bond issues uh, by large margins, 70 plus percent. We had a big bond issue in 2003, and 2007, not knowing what was going to happen in 2008, another big bond issue, almost $100 million. So the city had money to you know, buy parkland and build centers and double the greenway mileage at a time when the prices were pretty low in 2008, 9, 10, interest rates were very low. So uh, the citizens supported bond issues and really what allowed the extension of the system. Do you think that will continue? Sure. I mean, you've got, you've got the uh, you know, Dix Hill project going on. You know, all kinds of <coughs> parkland has been purchased that needs to be developed or put into conservation. So I think there's still, if there, you know, anything, there's even stronger support now for parks and rivers. It's also a big economic driver. We need to talking to companies that are either expanding or they're talking about coming here. We know everybody here loves our parks and greenways, but that's uh, that's something that most other cities don't have a system as extensive as ours, and it's a huge selling point for us. A greenway system is fantastic. Think about a greenway system as long as you're maintaining what you've got, it's always added. Every time you do something, you've got a bigger greenway system. It's really exciting. And when I was on the council, we would appropriate some money each year for that, but some of the greenways now are just so we're sitting here uh, in the museum's uh, civil rights exhibit as we talk about Raleigh's uh, transformance from a segregated society to an integrated society. And so um, how did the integration of schools and the merger of the city-county school systems change this community? And what other major milestones define the shape of the African-American community today? There are a lot of questions in there. Yeah. <laughs> For those of you who don't know anything about uh, the merging school district, uh, let me see if I can uh, fill in some of the blanks. This goes back to the early 70s, actually before then, because there was a study that came out of Vanderbilt, uh, and it was a study that looked at merger and the financial benefits. And that study came out in the 60s, so a number of school districts started reading the study and then started seeing the financial benefits of the merger. Well, closer to home, there are a couple of things going on. Raleigh City was dealing with uh, something from OCR that indicated that uh, they were beginning to take a look to, because there were some violations of Title VII and, as a result of what Raleigh was doing. And I want you to think there was a Raleigh City system and there was a Wake County system. Uh, Raleigh City system at, at that time between 1962 and 82 we closed 12 schools uh, in Raleigh City. Uh, when you think about closing schools in, at that time, you don't think about closing schools in Wake County now simply because of just the, the robust growth. But schools were being closed, and I say closed, that's during a, basically a 20 year period. Uh, losing students uh, in Raleigh City, in fact, it lost about 11% of the white population and those students were moving out to the county system. Well, it took some courageous people, uh, leadership in this community uh, in Raleigh. Uh, you had the Wake County Board, you had the Raleigh City Board, you had the County Commission, you had the Wake Delegation. In fact, there was a referendum put before the people, I think it was back in somewhere around 1971, 72, somewhere in that time frame. And that referendum was voted down two to one. It was a non-binding referendum that merged the system, voted down by the public two to one. Well, the courageous leadership didn't stop there. They worked through the great delegation uh, with the General Assembly and essentially merged Raleigh City and Wake County into one system. 
both of them were relatively the same size at one time, about 19,000 in the city, about 20, 21,000 uh, in the county, and they merged, which meant it brought all of those students together, brought all the resources in the community, at least out to the schools together, and ultimately it created you know, one big board, and then ultimately a board of nine, a board of education that, that ran with county. Where I think the difference came, once merger came, merger led to the magnet schools. And so if you start combining the two, that's why I shared magnets with you first, because I wanted you to see you know, how magnet schools played into that. Because once you merge the system, the other goal was then how do we desegregate? And you don't remember any major battles in Wake County and Raleigh and people fighting in the streets. There were no battles like that because there was some courageous leadership, some planning that was taking place. So once the system was merged, that wasn't enough. So there were two things that were going on simultaneously. One, the magnet schools to draw people in. And then there was a policy of 1545. 15 meant that no school would have uh, less than 15% uh, minority population and no school would have uh, more than 45% minority population. And then looking at the diversity of the city was about 30%, that's why the 1545 rule. So think 1545 and think merger, all coming together to create you know, the kind of school district. The third wheel of that came in 1998 and it was one goal, and that was we would have 95% of the students at or above grade level, and this was in 98 by 2003, five years span, 95%. You didn't hear any talk about achievement gap, anything of that nature, we said 95%. The deal was, any parent looking can see, wherever my child is, then this is the goal. It didn't matter whether that child was in Knightdale, it didn't matter whether that child was in Cary, it didn't matter whether that child was in uh, Garner, it didn't matter whether that child was black, white, any, it didn't matter. And that was the goal that drove the school system. So you had the academic component, you had the DSEG piece, and as a result, many districts came to Wake County. In fact, we belonged to a consortium that brought school districts here to see what was going on, and that's where the national model was established simply because we had a number of pieces in place that I think contributed to the health and growth of the community. Uh, you had uh, children in getting to know the best of one another as they were uh, entering the, uh, the various schools. Uh, we did move some teachers around in order to try to create this number of highly efficient and effective teachers you know, throughout the county. And there are stories after stories after stories of quality school. And the idea was, whether you look north, south, east, west, or central, you would see schools of excellence. That was the goal, and, and I think we achieved that goal. So, and if you don't believe we achieved it, let me, let me give you another stat. Right now, Raleigh is the second largest city in the state of North Carolina, correct? but it is, Wake County is the largest school district. Largest school district in the state, and somewhere around the 23rd or 24th largest in the nation. The bottom line is, people brought their families here, and a significant part of that was to take advantage of the K-12 education. Let me add a comment. I've often said, I think in some of my opinions, uh, that school merger is the most important thing that's happened in the history of this city. And by having a countywide school system and the Raleigh school system as Bill referenced was really dying. And it was not coterminous with the city limits. I mentioned city limits growing, but the Raleigh school system was not coterminous. It wasn't growing, it was fixed. And it was dying. And now we have a thriving school system. I know there's some discussions about some of the smaller communities having their own school system and so forth, but Anyway, that's my opinion on that. And another thing about integration that took place in September of 1960, and the first African American was Bill Cap, who became mayor of Atlanta later, but of course the uh, Supreme Court decision was 54. My father was actually on the school board at the time, and they felt like they 
should start integration at the second, first or second grade level. So Bill Campbell was a second grader. The first family that was pushing this is on its current history now, Joe Hope, and he's about my age, and they felt they never accepted Joe Hope because they deferred. And he would have been a ninth grader, tenth grader, eleventh grader. If you defer long enough, you know, he's finished high school, he's moved on. But we are working uh, with Open Village on a sculpture garden, and Joe Holt is on that planning group, and, and so he's been a very big part of that, so we're looking forward. I've had a couple of lunches with him. It's a wonderful bring it back together. And just to add on that, part of what that meant is as the climb was starting to grow in the mid to late 70s, really had been growing since then, the great majority of that growth, over 70%, came to Wake County, mainly because of the school system. That is, a lot of the jobs were out in Durham County, the Research Triangle Parks, so and most of the park is in Durham County. The people chose to live in Wake County because of the strength of the system. And that's the reason that the railway's grown so much in other parts of, you know, other parts of Wake County have not so much the rest of the time. Well, certainly, Mary, Mary George, you, you hit the nail on the head with the, sort of the next question about asking about what, in all of your mind, mm -hmm. what is that one decision, that one <coughs> monumental decision that Changed the trajectory of this city in, in great ways. So you said the merger of the school system. So I'd like to hear from the rest of the panel what they think were one of these, you know, found fundamental changes in this city. Those decisions, those big, big decisions. Of course, there there are lots of things you can talk about. I think one thing that's pretty basic, but as I mentioned often, is the Falls Lake project. Now that was got going in the 60s, and opened in the late 70s with that water resource, then Raleigh and that towns around all I could grow. If we didn't have that water resource, we would know where it would be and knew where we were at. What is that? <laughs> <laughs> we used to uh, take the water directly out of the noose. You know, there was no reservoir. Mm -hmm. So if there wasn't any rain, there wasn't any water. I mean, it was a big problem. <laughs> the big problem. There were three lakes on the south side of the city, but the false uh, reservoir was, was not there. <clears throat> when I was uh, even younger business guy in the early 60s, it wasn't, I mean, late 60s, early 70s, it wasn't like, so it probably came in the mid to late 70s. Let me speak another one, this one of course is much better known, by opening Fayetteville Street and Billy Newton Convention Center, that didn't transform downtown, but did sort of send a message out to the private sector that, okay, now it's time for you to invest here because the city now is going to invest in you. And since that time, the Fayetteville Street and the Convention Center started in 2005, I don't have the exact number anymore, but being and a half of two billion dollars of private investment, not just the big project, but all those small restaurants and stores and so on. So that helped sort of get this sort of movement back to the center city, uh, make it more of a mixed use place with the apartments and condos. And that really has changed the city. It's a very different downtown than it was mm -hmm. back in 2005. A little off the point of Raleigh, I think uh, relevant is the airport. You know, the airport went from a fairly mediocre airport where today uh, we went from American Hub, which a lot of us remember, and that was great having a hub. But they, they have a monopoly on that like Charlotte has now with their hub, but now we've got 54 direct flights. Smith and I both had the honor, I'm still sort on the airport board, but you know, it's we've got a first class airport there. That we, I, I would venture to say that we would not be on the Amazon list if it wasn't for our, our uh, Raleigh airport. So I think that's done a lot for Raleigh, but also for the entire region. Yep. Oh no, I'm staying with Murray. <laughs> <laughs> Don't totally understand why it's there and what it is. It's a nonprofit foundation because of reversing the brain drain. That was the problem in the 50s. So we're coming up on the 60th anniversary. It opened really the initial date is given was 1959. And I mentioned earlier the key thing with IBM coming here, but with the Research Triangle Park is there because of the three major Research One institutions and. And it's a nonprofit, although you got to have revenue to sell land, and that a lot of plans going on now. But that is how it's why it's there. And as you think of NC State, what that, what that meant to this community? I mean, it's obviously the biggest university, one of the three research universities. But if you think of what the technology that's come off that campus, whether it be Red Hat over here or, or you know, SAS or whatever it is, uh, that's been a huge factor in terms of the growth of this community. I mean, educating people, people come here technology comes off the campus. So having NC State and the two research universities has been just a huge
huge, huge factor for all. The only thing I would add is the health the healthcare systems of Duke and, and UNC are both incredible uh, assets for our community, and what they do for our community is amazing. They bring people up all over the world. So. And then let me remind you that as you think about these institutions, let's see. We have a public school on the NC State's campus. We got one tied to Wake Tech. We have one tied to Wake Med. You begin to see the drift here? It's, it's all connected. All right, uh, so this question is for uh, Mayor York and Mayor Meeker. Um, having a museum uh, in downtown Raleigh has been incredible to see the transformance of, of the city. Um, so downtown has had its ups and downs throughout its history. Can you describe some of the decisions and the processes uh, and the various efforts to transform downtown? Certainly Fayetteville Street Mall, Performing Arts Center, Convention Center, City Plaza, and Fayetteville Street. Can you kind of talk about the thought behind sort of some of these major changes to the heart of the city? Well, uh, in terms of Fayetteville Street, uh, shortly after I took office, we were talking about that. Uh, you can see that the mall had failed. That is, half the storefronts were closed, uh, the mall wasn't in good shape, and something had to happen. Uh, the Citizens Task Force, Carver Worthy and Jim Maskell, headed that up and came back and said, okay, most of us think you need to go ahead and open the road to traffic. Uh, of course, then that started the big debate of you know, how many lanes, whatever, whatever. It took a while to get that resolved. Uh, but that really uh, uh, was a major factor. I don't think any of us really realized what the impact that would have on downtown economy. In terms of the uh, convention center, uh, that was uh, a big decision as well. Having the hotel, hotel tax with the county helping was a big factor. Uh, the other thing that I'd never seen, I, I hadn't grown up here, but I'd never seen the view from the Capitol down at the Performing Arts Center uh, from street level. And when the old convention center came down, that was a striking view. And it really, uh, really is something. Of course, the new center is done well. The major thing, though, I think, again, is not so much the public investment, but it's the private investment that's coming behind it. It's been much bigger. You've got all the small businesses come here. You have people living downtown now. And that's what's really transformed downtown, not so much the public investment. I think that was just sort of a signal that now it's time to go ahead and do it. But it's the, the private investment that's really made a difference. In terms of the next, uh, next few years, downtown really needs to work on walkability, get rid of these one-way streets if we can so it's easier to get around. We focus on that. We need a really good farmer's market downtown that we don't want to have at the moment. There are other things that need to be moved forward with. But if you, if you look back at it, I think the city's investment sort of got the ball rolling. But really the change was from the private was not so much the city. Now, who built the school downtown? Two or three? Okay, I just want to be clear. <laughs> <laughs> One sort of fact going all the way back to 1792, as people don't really realize, is that like Hillsborough Street points due west. It points generally in the direction of the city of Hillsborough, Halifax to the north, Bedford to the south, and Newman to the east. So the capital was you like standing in the middle of a compass, and the original city was a square. So it's a planned city, and it's great to see a lot of the leadership that um, Charles exhibited here with his council. And what's really been gratifying to me is to see the move back to the urban core it's no longer, there's plenty of suburbs, a lot of people moving out, but there are a lot of people moving in too. And that's the most exciting thing about our city now, in my opinion, the uh, fact that a city, a city that's strong to the core is a strong city. And you go to a city that's hollowed out, and it's really very, so it's very exciting what's happening to, to the city. I know the density, some people complain about that, but the traffic would be worse if all these people were all trying to come in instead of a lot of them. Well, you know, if you walk down now, there really isn't traffic. I mean, we have this grid system, so right. it, it's not like you see it on your arterials where you've got one main road that everybody has to get so. John, tell us from a developer's perspective why you've come downtown. Because you've been very successful in North Hills, but now you've got two major projects on the well, I mean, downtown, we've always been interested in downtown. It's just finding the right thing for us to do. So when the Dillon and opportunity came along, we were very excited about doing that. And glad we just got our CO there. The parking deck is open. And we had residents moving in last week. So we're very excited about that. Our Peace Street project that you mentioned when you introduced me is, is something else. I, we, we've got a lot more planned for downtown. 
of what we're coming. I think we've come from a, from, I say this a lot, 15 years ago, uh, downtown Durham, you was not stepped foot in. Downtown Raleigh was not a place you want to be in after five and North Hills was going down all along. And look, and look at what we got now. We got three very vibrant urban uh, places there, downtown Durham, downtown Raleigh, and Midtown. So that's really, you know, a city coming to life. There are three phases of downtown. One, people said nobody comes down after five, they roll the sidewalks up and they were right. The second phase, people would still say that, and I would say, you're just saying you don't come down after five. <laughs> <laughs> and the third phase, nobody says that. Not everybody say that in a long time. Uh, let me add one other piece. I talked about magnets earlier and the draw of magnets bringing <coughs> families from North Raleigh, bringing families from Cary, bringing families from Dawn and from Cape Cod. A number of those families never would come downtown until those schools opened and they had to bring their children and then come back for events. So that too brought people downtown. Certainly, uh, we, we see uh, so many visitors and residents on Fayetteville Street for the Downtown Festival, so it is a truly a rebirth, regenesis of downtown. It's an incredible uh, transformation. Um, so, so you talked about your new developments um, in downtown, and certainly North Hills is your signature piece, and uh, if, if, uh, if none of you missed the opening of the time capsule, uh, couple of uh, last year, it was incredible. I wish people got that crazy about history all the time, but that was wonderful to see it buried in 1967 and have it open uh, last year. So could you talk a little bit about um, the, the idea behind North Hills and that idea about what you really, your concept, and what you wanted to do, and has it achieved what you wanted it to do? Well, when we first, uh, we first bought the, the old strip center where Lynn Dixie actually used to be, which is where Total Mine is now, that was kind of one thing, and then we got the mall side, and that kind of became another thing, and then we were able to accumulate more acreage on the other side. So the vision has actually evolved as we were able to accumulate more land and control that. And I think really, it was really during, during Charles's era when y'all approved the, the master planning, that was really the huge, the huge vision, quite honestly, of what really evolved there wouldn't have ever happened if, if Charles's council hadn't been really cool looking uh, with that at that point in time. So, it really has evolved into really a, a true midtown type vision, and fortunately we got a lot more to go. So uh, you know it's been very well received. Our retail does quite well, and I, and I, I praise Cameron Village all the time as Speed knows because you know that's another just great area of our city, and, and Lima South is another great area of our city that has another vibe to it. You know, so having different places like that within a within a community where people can have different options is really beneficial, I think, to the whole have the flow of the city and the vibe of the city and the way people feel because they've got lots of different options that uh, may be appealing to one in one place and not in another. So uh, the vision there has that really evolved into truly a good time. So what was your decision to go north? Because if you look at Raleigh, it's always grown north and west, not so much east and south so much. So what was your, how did you pick that area? Uh, you know, we really as a company have done mostly recycling. <laughs> And that's what that is, is really recycling. Our, our stand-up project right next to Tennessee State on Hillsboro was recycling. The Dillon project that we're doing is recycling. The project that we're doing at Peace of West is recycling. So all of that is really recycling. And that I think that's good for a city because the infrastructure is there, the utilities are there. You're not having to do that, do but so much, and you're taking something that's really kind of had its life and needs to be rebirthed again, and you're giving tax value back and something back to the back to the community. So that's really what we have been, most everything we do is recycling, but it has been for the last really 20 years. Paul always said that we grew to the north, and he wasn't facetious, but because going toward higher land, and the, uh, we did have to have pumps, you know, so the water system would uh, follow the news and run through the city, down to the street, and then, you think about it, most things do grow toward higher land for that reason, so a lot of people have to Further to North Hills, when you run the demographic studies, you've got out of 40 running there, you've got six more road, and you've got last mill connecting without having to go across an interchange. And so you look at the demographics, and the demographics are phenomenal. I mean, they're, you know, they're really, really great. And we knew anything just about what worked there and did it. 
certainly has, has fueled that North Raleigh development for sure. Um, so this next question for you, Mayor McFarland, uh, and this is the second shameless plug on behalf of the museum. Uh, we have two major parks projects underway in downtown Raleigh. And what kind of impact do you think Moore Square and Dick's Park will have for downtown Raleigh? Now, the shameless plug is that the museum is opening a new exhibit on Dorothea Dick's site, the park, its legacy, and its history coming up this October. Um, well, obviously, we're going to have spectacular, awesome, great impact. Um, but they're very different. You know, Moore Square. Um, never been to Bryant Park, think of a smaller version of, of Bryant Park. It really is, um, for the first time, we're actually going to have bathrooms downtown. That's a huge plus. <laughs> and uh, um, and that, that, that took six years just to get that yeah. decision made, because we don't own that property. That's the state's property, but we uh, manage it for them. But you know, it's going to be you know, we have these amazing assets that so many other cities would just kill for, whether it's that classic urban square that's you know, still going to have the big trees and all that, but it's going to be redesigned in a way that really brings you in. There'll be small areas around the edge that you know, could have a small group or play chess or whatever. There's going to be a kids' play area, a water feature, all those things on the list that people keep asking for. Um, but you really see it as a much more usable, friendly, you know, inviting space. And then Dorothea Dix, you know, no city has that opportunity that I can think of. 308 acres of beautiful, open, I mean, it's a beautiful open space right in the downtown. And so we are in the master planning process of that and in the process of doing all kinds of citizen engagement, everything from mayor, president, every festival, every, you know, they'll go to a festival and get 3,000 people and put just you know ideas they want to see or what they like or don't like. There's a lot of challenges with it because it was really built to be isolated. It was, and that was way out of the city in the you know, 1880s. But so that's uh, a lot of our challenges. Of really, how do we integrate it in, in the city? You've got you know a highway on one side and prison across the street, and then you've got uh, Lake Wheeler Road and. Um, so we are looking at you know greenway and nursery and bicycle and all this different things, but that is also you know how are we going to get everybody on and off? I mean I don't, we don't want to pave it so everybody can park, but we don't have a lot of options. So it's even just looking at the transportation challenges and all before we even start into the programming. And we've got what a million and a half. Sean's here. He's the head of the service. Million and a half square feet or so of buildings. Some are historic and some aren't. <laughs> you know, so I think there's antiques and old furniture. We got a lot of old furniture. And it's, um, so, you know, a lot of the challenges, whether we restore things or, you know, tear some things down, they're all full of asbestos in the plant and it's, it's going to be expensive. And, but, you know, all of the analysis of those buildings and what we can keep them will all go into thinking about what we want on there. You know, what's that? program is going to be, but it really is going to be a park not only for the city and the region, I mean the state, I mean we really have very high aspirations for this, so we're very, very excited and, you know, it's, it's one of those once in a, a lifetime and it'll be one of those projects that goes on forever, it, you know, well, as DHHS moves off, we'll start phasing it in as we, you know, the Conservancy is raising money and obviously the city will be paying money and we're still out, so. Great. so I hate to put you on the spot, but do you have, no. <laughs> do you have something personal you'd like to see out there? What well, you, you know like? what? Even if I did, I couldn't say that because <laughs> if I did and it happened, then they go see. <laughs> it was all about her. Um, you know, it's, I think one of the things that's really great about that is our, one of our neighbors is at NC State, and so we have NC State and it's a Spring Hill property, which is right adjacent to it and then we have Centennial Campus and then we've got the Farmers Market and some of the Department of Agriculture and if you just start to think about the natural things that come together with you know state agriculture and the agriculture department and NC State and the food culture that we have here in the, the ten, and it was originally a farm it was a plantation and even when it was a, a mental health hospital they grew all their own food it was also there's a rich history of farming and um, food production and 
Yeah, we say farm to table, that's just how everybody survived. But, um, so I really uh, hope to see something that incorporates all that together. One little historical note on that, Dorothy and Dex had like 1,200 acres, and as the mental institution the treatment, you know, more outpatient, we can discuss whether that's good or not, but that was happening. That land is what became Centennial Campus, so it was Dorothy Dex and the governor, Hunt was governor, transferred one state-owned property to another state-owned, one state-owned institution to another, so that's where the land came for NC State Centennial Campus, which was a tremendous opportunity to think a major university right in the middle of your city picks up another thousand acres. You know my life revolves around children, so I want you to think about this. I signed on as a part of the Dix Conservancy and to be a part of it. that thinking in that project, simply thinking about children, and if, if you've ever been downtown during a weekday, there are hundreds of buses that come downtown bringing children from across the state. They're coming for museums and uh, other resources that we have in our community. And I, I want you to think about these teachers and children that uh, quite often when they get off those buses and they're eating their lunch on uh, some sidewalk or something of that nature. What if those buses to take those children to this, this park and an opportunity to take their shoes off and frolic and teachers can exhale. <laughs> I just want you to keep that vision in your head. Uh, that's part of my selfish reason for wanting to be a part of this project because I see those thousands and thousands of children who come to the capital city. And now I want to just make certain that there's a, a nice place where they can relax and their teachers can relax and their parents come back at some point. So tell us, where is this place that you had so much fun? And a good model for that is actually the Pullen Park, which is one of the most successful parks in, in the state. And what you have is about a third of that park is developed. Lots of kids things mm -hmm. where, where people go. And of course also, uh, Tooth is actually a very quiet area that you can walk around. So uh, Pullen Park on a much larger scale is what the Dorothy Dix Park remains. But the mayor's going to put that aquatic center there, so I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, for example, we do have an easement over the Governor Moorhead, the corner of the Governor Moorhead property, and, you know, one of the things that the uh, park planners are even looking at is what's called a land bridge. And so it really is land that connects, would connect Dorothy Dix to Pullen Park, and you never feel like you're leaving one place and going the other, and then the traffic goes through, it's almost like a tunnel. So, there, I mean, the park planners that we hire are some of the best in the world, and they're just continually coming up with incredible new ideas. So, um, yeah, but we all want to frolic there, so. There you go. I saw the children, adults coming But it back. is, and the, you know, the, the thing is the mental health component of being able to get out and you know, the open space and in nature is huge, and more and more we're losing that in our daily lives and certainly in our children's lives. And so that is important tie in to what the park has been and what it will be to. Can you describe sort of how, how Raleigh interacts with education, higher learning, and how has that shaped the way the city has grown, in your opinion? Well, a couple things. One, if you have a smaller city and a big university, quite often you have this sort of town-down conflict. I love to refer to one of our neighbors that experiences that. Uh, fortunately, Raleigh is big enough that it really it doesn't have to sort of fight with or contend with the NC State and rather use it as a big, big asset. In fact, that's one of the reasons we worked on the first phase of the Hills Retreat Renaissance, was to get this great university a new front door. And really attract the way to come into the campus and now the council's doing the second phase. But I, I think by Raleigh being somewhat bigger, you don't have this sort of town down the disputes you would have perhaps elsewhere. And that that's what you would have in the university and the city working together to accomplish things as opposed to them being at odds. Yeah, I, I tell Chancellor Woodson all the time, I said, you just keep pumping out the talent and I'll keep making the place they want to live because that is really so much of what drives, you know, whether it's businesses or, or whatever. We want, you know, we want his students to love 
if you travel to the NC State campus and you go to the Frack Institute practically on any day, you will find teachers over there being trained and more specifically trained around STEM type activities and, and using technology. And right there, part of the reason that a middle school is right on that campus is that middle school was designed to be kind of a training site and incubator where we could train middle school teachers because that was one of the dominant programs at NC State. So you can see the, the connection and the innovation activities that's continuing. I want to mention one thing that's important, and uh, the state, what the state has, has done and doing, you know, with the, being the capital city, we've got the, of course, the Art Museum, we've seen the new Art Museum Park, and the Art Museum is fantastic, Emin Costner's here, and can I raise your hand up, see a white pair, yes, <laughs> Museum of Natural Sciences, Nature Research Center, I mean, that's a fantastic part of the city. The uh, History Museum is going to be building, uh, be building a new history museum and connected to the existing history museum. But those assets are, are tremendous. So they continue to evolve and, and really aid the whole city. So we're very fortunate the capital, even though we don't get some of the tax revenue from there, uh, I think they have a lot more than they take away. So this question is for our Mayor McFarland, Mr. Kane. Um, certainly we talked about this relationship between private and public partnerships. Um, so can you tell how, how this glue that combines these two entities together, um, how did that process work? Um, and how has it changed over the years? Has it changed for the better? Has it changed for the worse? Um, but certainly we see a lot of the effect of this private-public partnership but how did this successful partnership come to be? Well, I'll brag on the city. Uh, you know, we, we just did a public-private uh, deal with the city on the Dillon parking structure. The city needed parks down there in general. Needed them obviously for the train station. That's about that in the shore. The city had never done anything like that, and we had never done anything like that. And I just applaud Nancy and the leadership and, and roughly enough. I saw him earlier, I don't know if he's still here, but <clears throat> for really kind of doing that because it was, a, it was a risky thing to do and it was not without complication, I yeah. can tell you that, because we were all just kind of going on deep ground here. But we got done and you know, the deck is now CO'd and open and uh, it's, it's working. So I think it was a spirit of cooperation and good faith on behalf of the private as well as the yeah. public and it worked very work well. It did, and I really um, foresee that as. as more of the way to the future. I mean, if you have P3 conferences, they got to get invited to at least once a month around the country. And it is about sharing resources and doing projects together that really benefit all of us. One of the things I'll also call the city on there, I believe, if you ride in our parking decks down here in the city, not being critical of anybody here, but you ride by all these resort parks that are yeah. not used throughout the day. And we, we, we first started talking to Jim and Ruff and staff about that we said you know we really are a believer in 24-hour parking that they need to be used 24 hours not just when somebody happens to be there an hour a week and and the city was all all about that and so we're not going to have resort parking spaces mm -hmm. no any in that whole deck you know there will be must be parking in that but you're not going to ride by all these empty parking spaces right. on that cars and not be able to park in the, the city stepped out again on that and did, and did the right thing yeah, and we're looking at that because the, um, you know, in the past, part of trying to uh, bring businesses back to downtown was to work with them on, on parking. And so now, we don't quite have the problem of bringing people downtown, but the, we do have a problem with supply parking. So, you know, we are having conversations um, in some decks about, like what you're talking about, the shared parking, you know, businesses, and residential sharing parking is typically lots of time the residential is gone during the day. Um, also, the new Chris Larson, the new head of DRA, is talking about um, programs he's seen work other places that are basically sort of a buyback. He said he and his wife have three parking places downtown, and they both can walk. So it, it, you know, it's um, I, 
their work with employers to offer employees that, you know, instead of a parking place, they'll give you X amount of dollars. And the employees, you know, sometimes they live close enough, you know, use transit or whatever. So we're looking at new ways to look at parking, but certainly sharing it with the private developers and use these. When a park space costs eleven to twenty thousand dollars per parking space, you better be using that a lot. <laughs> yeah. It's hard to make those numbers work. Well, thank you for those answers, and certainly we've we've really celebrated uh, how wonderful Raleigh is and the success that has got us here. But I want to sort of throw to the the panel our greatest misses. What decisions have gone wrong in Raleigh? Banning garbage disposals. <laughs> but we fix, but we fix it. We fix it. Let me offer this. I don't want to offend anybody. Anytime someone tells you to build a major regional mall next to a belt line in a floodplain. <laughs> Uh, 
uh, the old saying is the only thing worse than too much traffic is not enough traffic. I think the question about the school system is one to be thinking about. The 1545 rule is by no means followed at all today. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the school system uh, here, as well as other places across the state, is no longer an integrated school system in many cases. And one of the things I missed entirely is reassignment of students and, and, and parents all <laughs> thanking me for that, so I do miss that. <laughs> people really understand how much the school system grows every year. I mean, it, it's, I mean, was it now, five, seven thousand, I mean, it's just, um, it, it, it's huge. <laughs> and it's like a high school, middle school, two elements and schools every single year. And, you know, my husband's from Rhode in Virginia, and they finally built a new high school. It's been 25 years since they even had enough people to build a new high school. So, it's like you said, too much or <laughs> too little, too much is a little better, but it's still a huge challenge. And you've got to build that many new schools, you've got to provide that many seats. You get people who have to be moved around, and that's a big part of it. When I left, we were growing three to five thousand. That's students. about what it is. Yeah. Last year wasn't yeah. quite as much. And, and, and to put it in perspective, the average size school district in the state of North Carolina is about six thousand students. Mm -hmm. uh, now, if I think about it, grow about five thousand students and you need five schools, or just you average, those 5,000 students don't go to those new five schools. Right? So you've got to reassign them. I mean, well, by definition. And, and I came up with the answer. I, I had the answer. <laughs> I, really do. Really? I still have the answer. I said to the people moving, if you don't want to be reassigned, if you call me before you move. Let me pick your house. <laughs> I promise you we won't ever reassign you. <laughs> they never did that. <laughs> John, you want the last word? Uh, no, I agree with you. <laughs> I will say, I see Joe Belazzo back there does a great job in transportation arena. I think a lot of people are critical of the, the transit plan to not have a lot of rail, but I will tell you, I think the transit group made a very good decision, the county made an excellent decision, and I think we're going to be really ahead of ourselves by not having committed to rail, because technology is changing so rapidly, we're, we're right on the verge of driverless cars and all the things, so I think that that's going to play much to our benefit in the future, so thank you guys for what you did lead on. Well, I hope each and every one of you have found tonight's conversation uh, thrilling, thought-provoking, and meaningful. Uh, because it is, it is a lot of uh, talent, a lot of uh, learned history, uh, a lot of experience up here tonight to talk about where we've been and where we're going. So uh, I hope that uh, each and every one of you take some nugget of knowledge uh, into your daily lives and to, to help us roll this in to make Raleigh a better place. And so, uh, Doug? We have, we have some time for questions. Can we do some question and answer? Are there any questions? Of course you don't have any questions for these people. <laughs> I have a question. What is the what can we do to stop the desegregation of schools? What is driving that and how do we prevent it? The same thing in my opinion that led to historic decisions in the school district and that is leadership in both the city and the county. And the leadership uh, educating the public and taking a strong stance on what we want our schools to look like and what we are prepared to do in order to ensure. Now the key to all of that is to insist that any school that a child goes to must be a school of excellence. Because if you don't send that child to such a school, then to me it's malpractice and it relates to that parent complaining about the quality of education here versus quality of education. So it's a combination of several things that have to happen. Um, very expensive consulting for purposes, so. <laughs> yeah. Yes, sir. Um, you guys have mentioned a lot of decisions that weren't easy decisions and possibly not popular ones, combining schools and, and definitely building water where there may have been houses and stuff like that. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, 
making those decisions and how you felt during it, knowing that it's you're going against the grain, but knowing it's the right decision for the larger future? Probably the prime example of that was, and Bill made reference to it, was the decision to merge the Raleigh school system and the county school system. That was Wade Smith is still very active around town. He was very much involved in that, other legislators, but that was, I was very much supportive of that, but I wasn't uh, voting on that exactly. But I think that decision, but they just decided it was the right thing to do. And, and they said, I've heard them say the ones that were involved, and they were probably, the thought was they'd lose the next election, but that didn't happen. That didn't happen. I think the other thing is when you've been involved with government for a while, you're a little more confident that you know, you're on the right track, even though it may not be necessarily the, the, the most popular thing for that day. And the main problem that you always have is getting a majority vote on your board. And you, you, know, you may think it's the right idea, and maybe it really is the right idea, but that doesn't mean your board agrees. It's hard to get people to move forward to get the call To us, had been the mayor, but he's also teaches uh, is a state teaches government, especially the mayor council manager form of government. And he said, you know, when you get elected to city council, there's no job description. You don't have a boss. Nobody tells you how to do this. And he said people see their role primarily primarily as one of two ways. They're either customer service or they're a trustee. And I think that's where you know when you have people that are customer service and you know, God bless social media, but they've got 20 or 40 people, you know, however many counted on them, and they see that their role is to do what, what those 20 people want because they are representing the public as opposed to people that understand, yes, public input is important because we're building a city together, but they also see themselves in the role of trustee, of ha being responsible for those big decisions that, you know, some people might but in the long run, they're going to be the best thing. It's never easy, and you take tremendous heat for it. Um, I mean, our house has been singled out, and I know my wife is here, so she can tell stories about uh, neighbors and, and how they re reacted and responded to some things. And, and I'll never forget the meeting that I had over at Moore Square <coughs> Middle School. And this meeting was uh, with about 200, 250 uh, black parents. And their concern uh, centered around the fact that their children were being put on buses and as they saw the distance from their home was uh, a significant concern. And they wanted the superintendent to do something does he not have any sensitivity to a five-year-old getting on the bus in the morning and sometimes in the dark and, and riding to a school in North Raleigh or something like that? So it, it, a spirited discussion took place uh, in that session. And I'll tell you how I answered that session. Um, I answered it this way. There was a, a newspaper article about a preschool, and the preschool was in North Raleigh. And in that article, it talked about the number of parents who practically camped out the night before because there were uh, a small number of slots left and how they wanted to get their children into that program. And I brought that newspaper article with me, held it up, and said, this is a, exactly my point, that those parents didn't care how far that program was, as long as that was a program of excellence and a superior program for their children. And I said, I bring that to the table as well. Wherever your children go to school, you have me if we don't provide an excellent education for your child. If we don't do that, then that is malpractice on our and, and that was kind of the, the, the bond of trust that went on uh, with that group of parents. 
And for me, sleeping well at night means that we've done what we need to do to create that school of excellence so that children perform appropriately and teachers can teach in a safe, secure environment. Now with the state legislature working on breaking up big school districts, is there a possibility of Raleigh and Wake County being broken up again? Um, yes. Yes. Yeah, there is. That's, that's the whole uh, legislative elected process. I mean, there is that possibility. I think that would be very negative. To I think it would be yeah. Yeah. <laughs> wrong, the expensive, I mean, there's a whole litany of reasons. But is, is there a possibility of that? Yeah, yeah. but the legislature yes. decides they're going to do it. Right. The legislature has merged the system in 76, I mean, 73, and back in 76. I mean, it could be, could be merged, so that's going to happen. There are 115 school districts, there are 100 counties, so there are already some counties where there are more than one school district in that county. So obviously I'm, I'm looking at 15. Do I think the possibility is there? Yes, I do. And part of the reason I think it's there because of a significant number of parents who move to Raleigh come from independent, smaller school district, and then they are now thrust into Big Wake County. And I think it works for them, it works for them very well from a resource standpoint, from a facility user standpoint, from a teacher sharing standpoint, all of that works, but do I see that possibility happening? Yes, I do. Sure, time for one more question. Okay, John Johnson here. Um, some of you on the panel, thank you all so much for being here, are younger, more younger than me when you started down this civic engagement path. My question isn't how can we make young people or just younger generations more responsive and more active in civic engagement, how can we make civic engagement more attractive to a new generation? There's a, a, a joke that you see if you're a resident here, you go around the room and you raise your hand, it's like, who's from Raleigh? No one is. But in 15 years, everyone in that room is going to be raising their hand, or 20 years. So there's kind of that generational change. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Sure. You know, actually, it's already happening at the local level. Yeah. Uh, we had a, someone in her 30s get elected at large city council this time. The county commissioners have uh, two or three younger folks. So it's happening. I think a key part, though, is having younger people wanting to be involved in the campaigns and the anti-gerrymandering stuff in the civic affairs generally. And that leads you to, for some of them, run for local office. Uh, but I certainly agree that it would be great if there was more of it, uh, but there is some of it going on already. And I think it is more than, than just the running for office. I mean, a lot of it is what are you passionate about? Is it, is it the arts? Is it history? I mean, what is it? And how do we get the people engaged on boards? It's, you know, nobody wants to just go to a meeting at night and sit for two hours. Um, no offense to any boards. But, um, <laughs> A lot of it is, is, you know, finding what people are passionate about and then engaging them in that because it, it's all civic engagement. I mean, we see so many uh, younger people, whether it's the March on Science or, you know, some other groups. Um, and our, I think in locally we are starting to see a lot more people um, get involved. Maybe we need to go back to having our meetings with the cherry bounce. You know, like <laughs> they started the city. The chamber has a good program leadership in Raleigh, which they generally younger you know, people, maybe 30 to 45, attend. And it's, a lot of people begin right there. In fact, uh, myself, in 1970, I went to a guy that's why I ran for city council. So uh, that's a good way to get involved with, this, with the city. That's just one way. I would say too, we, have, we need to have great candidates running so young people want to get involved and support them. I, I volunteered on um, Smith's campaign when I graduated from college. Well, again, thank you so much for coming. Uh, Douglas is going to end up uh, our program this evening. But again, thank you guys so much for coming to the City Hall Museum. And, uh,
you guys beat me to it, I was going to start with a round of applause. Thank you, uh, all five of you, our distinguished guests tonight, for being with us. We truly appreciate your support. Um, thank you all for coming. Uh, this museum is a, a wonderful museum uh, right here, the doorstep of Raleigh. As you saw in the video earlier, we are starting this million-dollar uh, campaign. We have $400,000 to raise. We're going to be relying on you all. We're going to be relying on folks like you, our leaders here tonight, to help us with that. Um, so keep uh, an eye out for events in the future. We have our biggest fundraiser of the year coming up in six weeks here in the museum, the evening gala, uh, called Time Warp. So grab some information in the back. Thank you all for coming.